Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. My guests today are the author and Buddhist scholar Stephen Batchelor and the philosopher Robert M. Ellis, for those of you who don't know, is, is the chair of the Middle Way Society. And the topic of the discussion today is the Middle Way itself and their understanding of it. A warm welcome back to you both to the MWS podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so just before we start, Stephen, what have you been up to since we last spoke on the podcast around a year ago? And I know you've been working on a book for a while now. Is, is that near completion? Uh, it's actually... Uh, completed all bar the copy editing. Um, I finished it uh, the end of last year. Yeah. And um, it's going to be called After Buddhism. Uh, we're still negotiating the subtitle, if there is to be one. Uh, it'll come out with Yale University Press, so it'll be a much more scholarly and, uh, you know, some are more, more reliable book than my usual productions, hopefully. And um, I've enjoyed writing it enormously because it's a book that's actually tried to pull together a lot of the different strands in my writing and thinking that I've been developing really for about the last 40 years. So it's quite a thick book, I'm afraid, but I'm quite happy with it. And um, it should come out um, in the autumn of this year. In fact, we're already scheduling a book launch in London on the 31st of October, if anybody happens to be around. Okay, well, I look forward to reading it, Tim. And you, Robert, what have you been involved with lately? Uh, well, I've also just completed a thick book. Uh, <laughs> that is uh, Middle Way Philosophy for the Integration of Belief, um, mm. which is the final book in my Middle Way Philosophy series uh, of four volumes, which is thoroughly exploring Middle Way Philosophy, where, you know, which brings together the Middle Way, Integration, uh, Embodied Meaning, you know, a variety mm. of different perspectives. Um, and the latest one is particularly about cognitive biases and fallacies and the ways we can work with them to integrate belief. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, after the, the publication of my introductory book, Miglism, uh, early last year, so, so I've now got, at least got a further sort of uh, explanation of, of the approach together with the introduction. So really? I've got both of those under my belt now. Great stuff. Okay, well, should we get started then? Um, could I ask you to begin, um, Stephen, by telling us what your understanding is of the middle way? <laughs> well, uh, okay, I'll try and be as brief as possible. Uh, obviously, this is a very central idea if uh, you are going to declare yourself in any shape, form or colour as being a Buddhist. And I do. I don't know whether Robert does or not, but I do. And I've thought a great deal about this idea ever since I came across it when I first came across Buddhism, basically. Yeah. But um, I think it boils down to two things for me. Um, first of all, it has to do for me with very much about the idea of integration. In other words, uh, it's quite clear from the Buddha's earliest uh, discourses that the middle way is equivalent to the Noble Eightfold Path. That's more or less a uh, to me, a, 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 start, a basic starting point. Yeah. And the way I understand the Eightfold Path is um, very much in terms of trying to live a human life that engages all of our capacities of uh, how we think, how we see the world, how we uh, motivate ourselves, how we speak, how we act, how we work. In other words, everything that comprises our humanity, but in a way that is somehow integrated. And I arrive at the idea of integration here. Uh, through m my reflections upon the meaning of the word sama, now which is usually translated as right, and so you get right view, right thought, right this, right that. I've never been happy with that translation at all. It has a sort of moralistic twang to it, and it, it, it presupposes its opposite, right, wrong. I don't think that's so helpful, at least in every aspect of our life. I don't think that's a particularly useful paradigm. The word itself, sama, quite clearly, um, means complete. I mean, there's no argument about that. I mean, that's what the word means. And so you get many, many, many usages in Pali, like, uh, like uh, you know, the complete ending of dukkha, 
is Samma Kayak. Samma is the same word. So I explored thinking of this more in terms of, of complete and remembering that the English word integral is based on the Latin integer, which means a whole number. So what does it mean, therefore, for a view to be sama, to be complete? I take it more now to mean that it is a view that is integrated into a, uh, into a whole. In other words, your views and your thoughts and your work and your life are not uh, hived off into special areas, which our society is very good at doing. Yeah. But rather, it's a constant attempt, no doubt one at which we're con- always failing but to try to bring the whole of our life into a coherent vision uh, in which how we speak and how we live and how we work are all somehow held together or working together towards the realization of what we consider to be the good. In other words, to me, the Eightfold Path in a little way is really essentially an ethical idea. It's about realizing what we we, we conceive of as, as a good life or a life in which we're able to optimally flourish as human beings. That's my first broadest understanding of a middle way life. Yeah. The other point, uh, the other angle I would take on this, again, is coming from early um, Buddhist suttas. In this case, the, what's called the Kachanagutta Sutta, the discourse to Kachanagutta, which is in the Sanyutta Nikaya, and is the basis for um, uh, a lot of what Nagarjuna speaks of in his uh, karikas, in his verses on the middle way. And this passage is one, again, I've pondered for a long, long time. And it has to do with conceiving of the middle way as um, a perspective on life that is not dominated or predicated on the concepts of is and is not, or ati and nati. Um, This is very, very clear in the text. I think it's a beautiful passage. Uh, I don't want to go into that right in any detail here. But what that points to is that a middle way approach is also one that seeks to avoid any kind of of fixity or attachment to a particular position, Um, whether that's an affirmation or whether that's a negation. Now, this to me uh, ties very much into what I also feel is a very central part of uh, a middle way approach, and that is one that that the, the, the values and encourages uh, the imagination and creativity. We remember, if you remember also in the Buddha's first sermon, when he speaks of the middle way, the fourth noble truth, so-called, he speaks of it as something that has, ha, has to be bhavetava, cultivated, developed, brought into being, literally. So the practice of the middle way is, is, is actually the practice of bringing it into being. And bringing something into being means to create it. The middle way is not lying ahead of us passively waiting to be trodden upon. But the middle way is a possibility that is available to us in each moment to realize, whether that's in our our views, in our thoughts, in our words, in our act. It's an ongoing, constant practice that requires us to treat much more lightly and perhaps ironically uh, the views and the opinions that we so easily get attached to and stuck in. This activates, to me, a kind of perplexity, a kind of curiosity, a kind of willingness to question. And here I'm tapping back into my Zen background rather than into the more classical Pali uh, tradition. But um, what, to me, this points to is if we're not invested in either is or is not, being or non-being, Uh, We're also, in a sense, open to the fact of the world as being fundamentally, in some sense, mysterious, uh, undefinable, unpin-downable in that way. And our response to it, therefore, is something that requires not just the replication or the repetition of a certain habit of mind or a certain religious belief, but it has to do with actually responding appropriately to the... The, um, uh, the uniqueness and the specificity of a particular situation or occasion. And that requires imagination, that requires creativity. And I see, therefore, the practice of the middle way is one that is, on the one hand, aspiring to integration, and on the other hand, always being open to uncertainty and mystery. Okay, well, thank you for that, Stephen. Over, over to you, Robert. Okay, right. That's very interesting, Stephen, and... Um there's obviously some more things in your, your new book, which I haven't read before, and your others, which will be um, quite exciting developments. So there's a lot I can relate to there. 
and certainly what you talk about, the importance of integration, which is a major theme of my own work, and obviously the middle way as uh, well, recognising the world as mysterious and, and as uh, not dominated by fixed beliefs. That's also very much in harmony with, with how I would interpret the middle way. Um, I guess a lot of where we, we differ, or where I suspect we differ, is a matter of style and approach, and you seem to be particularly an interpreter of the Buddhist tradition. What I'm trying to do is take it out of that tradition, really, so, so to take insights that I have gained from the Buddhist tradition and other places and create a model of the middle way which is uh, more adequate to a universal model, really, that's applicable to a variety of circumstances without any appeals to the Buddhist tradition mm -hmm. or, or interpretation necessarily of the Buddhist tradition. Um, so unlike you, I wouldn't tie the middle way to the Noble Eightfold Path, for that reason that I see the, mm -hmm. the Noble Eightfold Path as a particular kind of um, development, particular kind of formula used in Buddhism, which can be helpful in that tradition, but, but isn't nearly as universal in its application as the middle way itself. So the middle way, is, I would see, is, as a universal principle. Obviously, we have to have a name for it from somewhere, and, and Buddhism has provided me with a name for it. <laughs> but I would suggest that there is a middle way in lots of other places, in science, in Christianity, in, in many other traditions, that, uh, implicitly or explicitly. And um, so as to how I would define it, broadly speaking, any definition has its limitations, of course, but um, I see it as a principle of judgment, primarily so it's so it's a way in which we approach well interpreting the the flux of experience and forming judgments about what we assume to be the case out of that that flux of experience and so it's a principle of judgment that avoids metaphysical extremes so so either positive or negative metaphysical extremes so i mean that that seems to me to be a you know a flexible and universal way of talking about the middle way Mm -hmm. And um, obviously the, the value of that is that um, by avoiding delusions of, of the kinds represented by those positive and negative extremes, you can address conditions more effectively. Mm -hmm. so, so this is a, a very wide thing we're, we're talking about, that, that uh, you know, any person at any point could potentially judge in a slightly better way if they avoid the dogmas represented mm -hmm. by the positive and negative uh, extremes and um, I also think that, that those delusions on either side positive or negative are uh, absolutizations and, and that's so rather than the the emphasis which you get in, in I assume that you're largely inspired by Nagarjuna here talking about is and is not I mean I'd see that as obviously an element that you find in many metaphysical views but psychologically and that's where I think the universal element is it's, it's an absolutization or a tendency to, to think that uh, or assume that the particular representation of the world you've got at this point is the right one and the last, the, the end of the story. That's, that's the, uh, the right conclusion. Uh, and, and drawing that conclusion requires a, an assumption of a, of a perfect perspective, which we don't actually have. And you can relate that closely to, to the... Uh, the left and right hemisphere issues of the brain, that the left hemisphere has this tendency to uh, conceptualise in a particular way for particular goals and then get stuck, being a, particularly where it's over-dominant, not allowing new stimuli through the right hemisphere to, to question it or to provide new basis of, of thinking. So it can get stuck either in a positive way, asserting something, or it can get stuck in a negative way by denying something just as easily. Uh, and that's that's a point which I think tends to get neglected in, in a lot of discussions of the middle way, that mm. it's easy for people to try and use the middle way or to appeal to it. And yet, if you don't have a lot of care and, and even handedness, then it's easy just to get into a more or less negative position. Or if you're doing it with the assumption of some sort of traditional dogma, perhaps, then what you can end up with can just be an expression of that if you're not very careful and, and critical in the way you apply it. And um, obviously the middle way is also not just uh, a theory, it's uh, tied in with practice. So, so to, to avoid it just being another absolutization itself, it has to have a, a continual interrelationship with practice yeah. uh, that, that informs it uh, and continues to challenge any particular uh, conceptions we get on the basis of our experience. But um, in, in order to avoid 
falling into dogmas we need um well i think both continual with you but also firmness in in not accepting metaphysical interpretations mm-hmm. no that sounds great um the um but on the other hand when you speak and you try to universalize this idea of the middle way which i which i am very sympathetic to um nonetheless everything you've said so far has to me got a very buddhistic spin to it and i'd like to hear from you some examples in other traditions um, where we find uh, this similar principle, as you uh, mm. consider it to be, um, uh, uh, clearly stated. Right. Well, I suspect it's, it's perhaps not as clearly stated in, in most traditions as it is in Buddhism, and I think you, know, you can find it implicitly sometimes. Um, but very often it's also a question of finding what is positive and, and um, mm. provisional and helpful in a you know, wide range of, of sources. Mm. But obviously, I mean, there, there is something we can get from scientific uh, method uh, in terms of the, the, the need for provisionality, which, which science recognises. So, so it's you know, the, the need to use evidence in, in supporting our views, yes, but also to be willing to revise those views. So that's a kind of scientific attitude, which mm-hmm. uh, may be used by scientists in formal academic science, but may also be, be adopted by, by individuals in, in that kind of scientific tradition. Uh, and I don't think, um, in some ways, science seems to articulate that better, or at least people inspired by science seem to articulate it better often than Buddhists do, you know, because I've, I've yet to see a, a really helpful Buddhist account of provisionality and what provisionality actually is, even though it's often assumed that, you know, Nagarjuna, say, uh, has a provisional view of the world. You know, science seems to articulate that better. Um, mm-hmm. But if you want to think about other religious traditions, for example, um, I think there are some ways where, with a great deal of interpretation, one could gain a, a middle way out of Christianity. I think it, you know, it takes interpretation in Buddhism as well. <laughs> it's a question of how much uh, it takes selectivity and, um, on the basis of, of what one believes to be helpful. But where I'd find it potentially in Christianity is, is in the incarnation. So this constant balancing between the divine and the human. And, and so this, this very difficult... Uh, balancing act mix which Christians have tried to wrestle with through the centuries between trying to fit in with these perfect rules of God on the one hand and recognising humanity and its weakness and sinfulness and so on 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 the other Um, so if you can somehow live in that space instead of jumping to dogmas about how Jesus has already saved you or whatever then I think it's possible to come to uh, middle way like positions through Mm. that kind of process Mm -hmm. But well, of course, we also have the, the, the Western sceptical tradition, uh, going mm. back to Pyrrha. Yeah. Uh, there, I think, you find, actually, although he doesn't use the word middle way, yeah. um, the, the, the fragments that we have of Pyrrha, that are perhaps reliable, uh, suggest, again, finding a position in which neither is nor is not, both or neither, the, the tetralemma. Yeah. And, and the seeing that not just as a sort of a metaphysical game or an yeah. intellectual exercise, he sees it as what will lead us to aphatos and to ataraxia, in other words, to a state of speechlessness in which conceptuality and any kind of opinions are suspended, and that leading to uh, a a trouble-free state of mind, which is very close, I think, in many ways, to the Buddhist understanding of nirvana. Um, And that's a tradition, that's a a connection that I'm very much interested in trying to pursue, to see how through uh, the classical schools of scepticism, and then we see that revived, say, in Montaigne, and we see it carried on through the European Enlightenment, then, as you yeah. say yourself, and I completely agree with you, how that approach, that sceptical approach, is fundamental to the whole scientific yeah. endeavor. Yeah. And also, I picked up your reference to the two sides of the brain and so on, and no doubt you have Ian McKilchrist's book in mind. Yeah. Um, and again, that, I think, reinforces very much, it gives us a great deal of... Um, uh, a, a very, very, I think, uh, compelling foundation for this sort of middle way approach. But I was still, I still feel when, when I hear you speak that in some ways, and this is perhaps a criticism you'd get more from people who weren't Buddhists, but uh, nonetheless you're taking a Buddhist concept, which we admit we don't find really explicitly stated anywhere else, and then you're using that as your kind of optique, your, your lens, uh, through which to then explore uh, these other traditions. And I think that's an incredibly valuable thing, whether it's a Buddhist project, I'm not really, frankly, terribly interested in, but I think we both seem to acknowledge that it has its roots 
in a Buddhist insight, whether it's from the Buddha or from the Gajana or whatever. And um, like you, I also struggle enormously with Buddhism. Um, and a lot of what goes, most of what goes on under the name of Buddhism is something I really don't want to have much to do with. Um, it, it seems to exhibit in many of its uh, forms, whether they be what's written or what's, uh, what's taught or the institutional structures and the hierarchies and so on, to be really quite antithetical to the spirit of a middle way approach, which is, I guess, paradoxical. Because after all, we're back now with the tradition that supposedly, been, you know, the initiator, or at least was very influential in, in, in stating these principles, and yet doesn't seem to be able to live up to them terribly well itself. In fact, it seems to fall into the very traps that it warns against. If um, the middle way, though, as a fundamental principle, was the filter, in the sense that the Buddhist tradition put everything through, whether it be rebirth or whatever, wouldn't mm. that be the safeguard against these ideas becoming dogmatic? Um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit dangerous always to say Buddhist tradition does X, Y, or Z, because Buddhist tradition is rather a big piece. But broadly speaking, yeah, I agree. And, and I think Buddhist tradition, or Buddhism, or Buddhism as a religion, has basically been co-opted by powers outside that of the, uh, you know, the central vision of the, of the tradition itself. And we see this everywhere, we see it in Christianity, I mean, so. It, it, that as soon as you institutionalize or metaphysicize any particular um, you know, view of the world that perhaps has liberating potential, uh, it tends to compromise that liberating potential. And um, Buddhism seems to be trapped in that uh, as much as, as pretty much any other tradition. So um, I think it's very important, actually, that we liberate these key ideas uh, like the middle way, from Buddhist orthodoxies and Buddhist institutions. And as someone, I think, said many years ago, uh, the Dharma is too important to be left to the Buddhists. And uh, I think that's probably true. And that sounds a bit arrogant, I agree. And I do call myself a Buddhist, but I wonder why sometimes. And there'll be plenty of people out there who prefer that I didn't. Yeah. But if I'm going to be honest, this is the tradition in which I feel very deeply rooted for my whole adult life. And I feel an enormous indebtedness to it. And I feel an enormous sense of, I identify with it very much. But at the same time, I find myself infuriated by so much of what is presented in the name of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you were once a Buddhist, Robert, why did you choose to... Apostate. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come an apostate, yes. <laughs> why did I leave? Well, um... I think I found too many conflicts, basically, and I found, uh, although I learned a lot about the middle way and particularly about its practices and, and ways of practices that could help one on the middle way from the Buddhist tradition, uh, and particularly from the particular school of the Buddhist tradition I was involved in, which, which was Trivatna, um and, and Sangha Akshita's work. But at the same time, I found that in constant conflict with appeals to tradition, uh, appeals to the authority of particular figures like Sangha Akshita himself, mm -hmm. um, and um, appeals to metaphysical concepts, which, which include not just karma and rebirth, which is a well-known target, but also enlightenment itself and, and the appeals to the authority of the Buddha. So, in effect, the Buddha being used as a source of revelation mm -hmm. um, from a, a point which is in practice beyond our experience. It's only, only theoretically attainable by us. Um, so, um, and I also felt, I, I suppose for a long time, I was impressed by stuff like the, the emptiness of emptiness and, and the, the ways in which, uh, you know, there was theoretically a critique in the Buddhist tradition of uh, that nirvana wasn't ultimately uh, metaphysical truth and, and all that, um, and the relationship that it has with practice and so on. But very often in practice, in the end, I felt that that critique acts as a spoiler. So uh, people will happily recite this in a, in a puja or a ritual or something of this kind, or they'll talk about it, but... To actually use it as a basis of judgment mm. requires another kind of process that is thinking through, well, what does this, what does this mean? What does this uh, involve when you apply it to all our ethical thinking, for example? So, so, so often the middle way is just sidelined when ethics is concerned and, and they wheel in the, the five precepts or whatever, or monastic rules. Um, or um, what difference does it, does it make to our, our understanding of science and how we should... Uh, relate to the scientific tradition and, and so on and very often I found also the 
what were given as top billing as kind of the the important um, principles in Buddhism were things like um, conditionality, which often became, I mean, it's a matter of interpretation, but often became a metaphysical principle itself, mm. uh, or enlightenment, or the three jewels, which are uh, focuses of devotion, um, and all of those, uh, or, or the Four Noble Truths for that matter, and, but all of these things can be interpreted in a way which is compatible with the middle way, but they can also be metaphysicized. So mm. I think it's most important to start with um, with a principle of judgment which, which tries to head off that possibility of metaphysicizing it in the first place, which means you have to give priority to the middle way. Mm. Um, if Buddhism did that, I'd be much happier to call myself a Buddhist than, than I actually am, but I've yet to come across a Buddhist movement that, that clearly gives priority to the middle way in practice. Okay, but what, why did you not decide to become a reformer like Stephen? Did you at some stage feel that you could uh, change the true Ratna to an extent from within? I did. I had a, some go at it, but um, I didn't feel that uh, I was capable of making much impression on that tradition. And I suppose, well, the point where I decided to leave the True Ratna order was uh, after I gave a talk at the retreat centre of Hamaloka, um, where I did, I did put forward some of these ideas and, and I uh, actually was critical of Sangharakshita, which is well, something I've felt good at Pamaloka. Um, but uh, so having, having done that and tested the water a bit, I found such a negative response from probably the majority of order members I spoke to about, what, what, about the talk that um, it became clear to me that most of them, or the majority of them, not all of them by any means, but the majority of them were heading in a different direction or seemed to have different priorities. Uh, so there wasn't enough similarity I suppose in our approaches on the whole in the end I felt it, it was always a, it was always a judgment call it, w- it wasn't always it wasn't a clear-cut thing it wasn't that I decided Buddhism was bad um, but it was it was a question of could I work within this tradition mm. in a, a pragmatic way and in the end I, f- I felt it was better to try and explore ways of doing so outside it um, so that's what I've ended up with mm. but obviously with um, uh, you know, complete recognition of how much I owe the Buddhist tradition, yeah. Mm. Yeah, you see, for, for me, I think probably most Buddhist institutions that we have today are pretty much beyond salvation. And I think that, um, and I think one has to be careful in over-identifying any particular Buddhist school with, with, with Buddhism, or at least the Dharma, mm. uh, as we find in the earlier, in the earlier source. Um, I mean, I've left several Buddhist traditions. Um, I don't identify with any of them. I'm certainly not a Gelugpa with which I was trained. I, if anything, I might be more happy calling myself a, a, a Son Buddhist, but that doesn't mean much to anybody, basically because they, they just question everything. Uh, but I don't go for all the other stuff. And um, I'm not a Theravani Buddhist, and I don't belong to any, you know, modern order like the Tri Ratna. I have really no interest in these things. And um, but on the other hand, I do feel a very deep uh, linkage and... Uh, almost a sort of umbilical link, which is maybe not a good metaphor. But um, that's just to be honest. And what I, find, what I found enormously um, helpful in, 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 in struggling with these same concerns, but it's sort of a love-hate relationship with Buddhism, constantly a battle, if you wish. Um, but has been going back as far as one can to recover something of the humanity of the Buddha. I mean, my new book will, will spell this out in a lot more detail than I've done before, to try to recover the Buddhist humanity. This is a similar movement that we find in Christianity. And I think, I, I've been very influenced by uh, Christian theology, as you're probably aware. Um, and, and some of them, I, I feel much more in tune with liberal, radical Christian theologians than I do with anyone writing in the Buddhist world today. There's no, no question about that. Because they're willing to really say, put aside all of the dogmas, the metaphysics, the orthodoxies and so on, and, and really ask the deepest questions, you know, why was this person, Jesus, special? Why was this person, Gautama, special? Um, and once you start to recover the humanity of these people, it becomes more and more difficult to set them up as icons of ultimate authority and revelation. It begins to erode, because the person is no longer so ultimately other than you are. Mm. And religion, re- belief systems, all have to work on the premise that Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, whatever, are somehow of a different order of, of being, a different order of humanity. They are somehow God is speaking through them or the Dhammakaya is speaking through them. As soon as you get to that, you've lost the human person. 
And at the same time, uh, to take some of these key ideas like middle way, and what's striking about the middle way, for example, is that the very first words that the Buddha says in the very first sermon are, I have found a middle way. Yeah. And the very last words he says to the disciple Subhada, who comes to him on his deathbed, Subhada says, how, how would I know whether something anybody teaches is uh, of your teaching or not? And he says, wherever you find the middle way, wherever you find the eightfold path. So it's the alpha and the omega of the Buddha's dharma, as far as I'm concerned. To, to mix metaphors. <laughs> but, but when you get into even ideas like the three refuges, stream entry, a lot of these ideas that have been ratcheted up to the level, level of non-negotiable dogmas, when you burrow back, you find that they're actually much more accessible, practical uh, tools, uh, instructions for living human life from day to day, not these grandiose things that they have evolved into. So my attempt to recover the Dharma um, is to put aside all of the Buddhist orthodoxy and all that stuff and try as best one can at this distance in time to tap back into the source. And then that's not an end in itself. That would just be fundamentalism. You know, this is the, we don't move from here. But I'm interested in trying to get back to a ground from which we can start all over again. And I have a funny feeling that Robert's probably doing something similar trying to uh, articulate what the key insights are in order to start something afresh, not to repeat the past. Mm. Yeah, that would be very much fit uh, as a description of what I'm trying to do, yeah. Um, I mean, I wish you, you luck working within the, the British tradition, but I think you're, you're up against a, a great deal. Oh, there. <laughs> um, not to be underestimated. And, and I think there's also another danger, perhaps, which certainly I've detected in failed to have detected in your work so far, which, which perhaps, um, I don't know if it's going to be ratified in your new book, but the, but the danger of slipping into postmodernism or, or some sort of relativistic position. Um, that, and that's what I, uh, my overwhelming impression of, of many of the Christian theologians who've gone down that route as well. Although, you know, I've worked with Don Cupid, I was supervised by him at, at Cambridge, and, and I've got a lot of respect for him. But um, he's, um, he doesn't, in the end, for me, have a, an account of what ethics is and, and why we should value one thing rather than another uh, mm. if, if you're not applying to a, a metaphysical source um, uh, and why it's more than a question of preference or a question of convention, how we should act. Uh, and, um, and that's where I think the, the middle way offers a way forward, you know, that, that we understand uh, what is better or what is the good. I think it, how many, some things you said earlier, Stephen, but... Um, that we understand the good in terms of the middle way, that the, um, the, in terms of the avoidance of delusions or ways in which our, our views may get stuck, um, and that our, our moral judgments need to aspire to meet that and to avoid the delusions of, you know, not of, of any ethical theory, but of getting stuck in one particular theory as the final solution, you know, any one particular moral principle or any particular approach like utilitarianism, for example, as the final single way of, correct way of doing ethics. Um, so I, I guess that's, um, that's the thing I overwhelmingly find missing in uh, a lot of these more modern critical treatments of religion, in a way, mm -hmm. that they haven't really grasped that nettle of what ethics is and why it's important. Yeah, but you see, this is, I think, exactly what Buddhism can bring to these people. And I think Don Cupid, in at least some conversations I've had with him recently, sort of acknowledges that. He says the one thing that's different about Buddhism is it might actually work. <laughs> no, seriously. So um, uh, uh, he, oh, he says has a good chance of being able to work. In other words, it's actually something that has a sufficiently coherent underpinning to translate into an ethical life that's not just, you know, postmodern relativistic we do, you know, or seem and so on. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think that's the case. And I, but, so I feel that the, the, the people like Cupid and others, um, and another one, Rorty, I'm kind of into Rorty as well, but again, uh, we're not going to be Rorty. The, um, well, I found that they've been very helpful in allowing me and helping me to deconstruct Buddhism. But I feel that the, what that's brought me to is a set of principles and values that could, I think, be enormously valuable in uh, giving um, a lot of these modern critical thinkers some kind of 
focus, some kind of coherence, some kind of value system that is not metaphysical, uh, that is not sort of fixed in views, but is nonetheless uh, supported by a very sound um, uh, and ethical uh, perspective and vision. So I think the two coming together is what interests me really. But surely that applies, doesn't that apply to any other tradition? That If you interpret it in terms of the middle way, Mm -hmm. you know, if you interpreted Christianity in terms of the middle way, (coughs) you would end up with something provisional and useful. Yeah. Uh, so, there's, so there's nothing intrinsically superior about Buddhist ways of working, apart from the fact that it articulates, or to the extent that it articulates the middle way. Well, that may be true, but I, I, I would agree with you. But the point is, whether you like it or not, you're still bringing in a Buddhist idea to, um, to help uh, guide you in your thinking. That you are, ultimately, if there weren't Buddhism, would you be plugging away at this idea of the middle way? Uh, certainly not in terms of personal history. No, I wouldn't have, have encountered it or come to understand it. Certainly, I'd acknowledge that. But um, it's just that I think if you if you emphasise the Buddhist nature or identity of the Middle Way, then again you've got there's this danger of alienating people from other traditions that uh, for whom you know, it could be just as important. That's what's attractive for me actually, Stephen, about um, Robert's approach is that very point that. Um, I mean, I love your work, and, you know, I've been on many retreats with you, and, and I, I'm sure I'll be on more. And, uh, but um, it's the universality of the idea that Robert puts forward that I find is a lot more accessible, potentially, to a lot of people. When we think of a term like pragmatism, we don't call it Deweyism or whatever. We're interested in the idea behind that particular mm. concept, and, um, and that's what I like about the middle way. You don't have to tie it to it. You, you can make a, an, an acknowledgement, you know, how, how important a source Buddhism is for the middle way but as Robert says you do find uh, interpretations of it in history in all fields of human endeavour yeah um, well I'm completely sympathetic to that approach and um, I sometimes uh, I do agonise over the fact as to whether I should keep myself within the Buddhist camp because as Robert suggested you get a lot of flack I mean I get people out there who actually hate me you know, the serious Buddhist scholars and people who think they know what's what. Um, I'm not popular in many circles. But I also have a, a considerable number of people who may or may not self-identify as Buddhists who find that um, I give them a way into Buddhism, into Buddhist practice, that they probably wouldn't find anywhere else. Sure. And so I find this to be a, a considerable dilemma. But I'm still also struck by, let let me just take another example, mindfulness. Mindfulness has now become, you find it everywhere now, and um, it's being adopted in all sorts of different realms, and uh, there's always some vague acknowledgement that it's Buddhist, this, Buddhist, that. But I think that's actually a failing to acknowledge something. Um, uh, I think there is a kind of Trojan horse uh, process going on here. I think mindfulness, and maybe down the road, middle way philosophy. These are, I think, ways in which Buddhist tradition, however sort of uh, reformulated and and, and uh, reimagined, are ways in which contemporary culture, let's say global culture, are are, uh, being influenced and being directed in different uh, fashions by uh, the ideas that are essentially Buddhist. Mm. I don't like the word Buddhist, Frankly, I, it's a modern invention. It only started being used in the 19th century in English. In, in, in English. Uh, I'd much prefer to use the word Dharma, but again, that's full of problems as well. Perhaps we need to abandon all of these kind of jargon terms. But the problem is, as soon as we set ourselves up to articulate any kind of coherent vision, we have to give it a name. Yeah. We can't just call it Robert Ellisism or Stephen Bachelorism. No, we're speaking beyond our own particular personalities and we are looking to find and to locate principles that we are deeply committed to and value and to articulate them in ways that we hope will enable people to lead more flourishing and more rich and more compassionate and more humane lives. And um, I I don't think it's just... uh, I think that perhaps the the point that that differentiates us is that is, is, is perhaps a willingness or a different sense of where on the scale of things the Buddhist element comes into play. I think it probably comes into play more than, let's say, the mindfulness people are willing to acknowledge. Um, I might be wrong, uh, but I'm very, I, I get a hunch uh, that um, 
uh, mindfulness, middle way, bright lively, that was a term that was popular some time ago. Um, these are all kinds of, these are media, these, these are concepts that allow Buddhistic uh, values and ideas to filter into a non-Buddhist world. And I'd be perfectly happy at the end of the day that we drop terms like Buddhism altogether. I don't think it really matters sure. at all. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I do think we need to be honest and we need to be upfront about where the sources of our inspiration are coming from. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Sure, I think it's definitely one thing to, to acknowledge the sources of one's, one's inspiration. Um, but you also you, you used the term essentially Buddhist a bit early on then, Stephen. I mean, did you really mean that? <laughs> Is there an essential Buddhism that's working no, its way out in this way? No, not as, I, I, I'm very wary. Of, I, I, if I use the word essential, I really apologise. That was a bad move. <laughs> right. no, I, I think it's a, I, I, it's, I, I spent a lot of time at one point, especially when I lived in England, and we had all of these interfaith Buddhist groups, and we tried to define what is Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Hopeless, completely hopeless. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, so, so as long as you acknowledge that, I mean, that, that obviously Buddhism is, is a not an entirely fixed thing, it's a process, it's a tradition, it works its way through and influences in all sorts of ways. But, I mean, my work is not just an outcome of Buddhism, it's also, there's a lot of stuff from psychology, mm -hmm. um, you know, embodied meaning theory, uh, aspects of, of philosophy, and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and also Ian McGilchrist's work on the brain, and so on, yeah, so uh, uh, fed into it. So I think there's, there's, uh, there's ways it's an outworking of those as well. And you, know, you could take this from another point of view, you could say, oh, this is all psychology and you know, it's part oh. of the history of psychology. Um, or you can even see it as an outworking of Christianity. I'm sure some sort of some theologian at work right now, some young theologian on his PhD thesis about how new forms of Buddhism are really Christian. And, and so, uh, they do. Um, um, <laughs> so it's just a, it's, it's a particular gloss you can put on it. And, mm. and you know, if it, gives coherence to what you're trying to do that that's great but um i don't think it can be essentially that any more than it's essentially anything else and i agree with you um but i do feel that there is let's say a cluster of core values or something like that mm. uh, that inform buddhist tradition and have informed buddhist tradition through the centuries um and we could you know argue as to what they are. i don't think it's terribly important to try to pin them down because everyone will come up with their own list but um I suppose I would in some senses. And then the middle way kind of captures it all for me. I mean, you've got the eight, at least, I mean, you sort of sideline the Eightfold Path a bit. I don't. I think the Eightfold Path is not a Buddhist, uh, it is Buddhist in, a, in an obvious way. Yeah. But to me, it's just shorthand for a, a complete human life. I don't see it as anything other than that. And I think that's the beauty of it. I think what has happened is that Buddhist tradition has tended to isolate certain elements of the Eightfold Path, particularly mindfulness and concentration and, and right view, terrible word, um, and so sort of just made that into the main thing and has basically sidelined and forgotten everything else. You, you can go through the suttas, you'll hardly find anything on livelihood or speech, or it's just not there. And so this, the very tradition itself has self-selectively Mm. privileged certain aspects of the Dharma that were clearly the primary preoccupation of the monastic communities who, were, who had a vested interest in preserving those elements. And so what comes down to us is not the Eightfold Path anymore. What comes down to us is basically a, a variant of Indian renunciant religion that seeks to achieve salvation uh, through not being reborn, uh, according to the ways in which Buddhist tradition has pre preserved or developed certain um, strategies and soteriologies and so on. Mm -hmm. To me, that's not the Dharma. That's something that has evolved historically. But once we get back to the early sources, and I, I'm sorry to keep going on about this, but I, I found that, the, 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 that this has to me been the most exciting thing in my studies of Buddhism all along, is, is this recovery of, 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 of origins. Uh, and rethinking classical terms. Um, and I find something very different back in the source than I do in pretty much every form of Buddhism that is available today. And so I can discard Buddhism as you do in terms of the institutions and the metaphysics and the dogmas and so on. But I do think that they do stem from a source uh, to which I do feel a, an enormous attraction and, a, and an affinity. Um, without trying to reduce it to some sort of dogmatic essence. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. I see Buddhism really as an organic, as a bit like an animal, as an adaptive organism that um, mutates and evolves according to the new environments that it continuously finds itself in. And in this current day and age, the environments are so different to any of those under which classical forms of Buddhism have emerged that the form of adaptation is going to have to be very radical. One image I've often thought of is that Buddhism needs some very, very radical surgery, and it's questionable as to whether the patient will survive the operation. Yeah. Yeah. Is my sense, yeah. and perhaps that's what you know. Both of us are doing in a way is we're, is we're doing a, a sort of radical surgery. Buddhism may not survive that surgery, yeah. at least Buddhism as we know. And what comes forth, who knows? Indeed, yeah. Um, just going back to what you were saying about the Eightfold Path, there, I, d- I do very much agree that there's some very helpful elements there in the way that the Eightfold Path interrelates different ways of working. Uh, the, you know, the idea that we need to work on different things at the same time at different levels, if you like that we're that we're working in terms of, in a broadly meditative terms, we're working in terms of our beliefs and views, um, and we're working ethically in terms of our behaviour. Um, I suppose that that's why I actually always preferred the threefold path as a kind of similar, um, simpler mm-hmm. formulation of that. Um, but at the same time, you know, you could just put that in different terms, couldn't you? That, mm-hmm. that, um, Probably. <clears throat> yeah, there have to be eight no. limbs of it, you know. <laughs> you, you know, there are, there are potentially different versions. But so presumably, I guess your your deeper point is there is that we need to understand that there are different elements of the path and that they hang together. You know, you know that, that there's a synthetic process yeah. involved. Uh, so well, not only that, but I think we have to. And this one of the things I really can't stand about a lot of Buddhism is that when people talk of my practice, they usually, almost entirely, they refer to sitting on your bottom, cross-legged, and doing some kind of spiritual exercise. Yeah. Now, the word practice, bhavana, applies to every single one of those eight steps. Yeah. In other words, uh, I think it's a huge mistake to yeah. privilege certain aspects of the path yeah. as the practice. But instead, to recover an idea that the whole of your life is a practice. Yeah. To give as much importance to the person who's, you know, developing a company, but to give as much importance to a person who's, let's say, a communicator or working, supporting a family, all of these activities are practices. Mm-hmm. And not to privilege monks in modern monasteries meditating. Mm-hmm. Meditation, nonetheless, I do think, is an important part of an integrated life. Mm-hmm. But not to privilege it. Yeah. It's rec- so for me, the April path, well, there's 8, 9, 10, 11, doesn't really matter. But it's to acknowledge that practice, is, is, it has to be an integral activity that embraces all aspects of who we are. Okay, well, I'm um, yeah, very pleased with that, Stephen, that, that we found so much uh, to agree upon. And, uh, and I wish you luck in your quest to reform Buddhism, which, uh, <laughs> which uh, deserves as much uh, support as it can get, really. Um, yeah. and I hope there'll be similar quests in other, other traditions as well <laughs> with similar lines very good ok well thank you very much to the pair of you for a very engrossing chat today I really enjoyed it ok um, well thank you very much for organising it uh, Barry very 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 much indeed it's great I'm really pleased to have met Robert at least virtually You can find out more about Middle Way Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org.